everyone. I want to, first of all, wish all the moms out there a happy Mother's Day. Pray the Lord's blessing on you this day and just your, his wisdom uh, over you uh, as you live your life and uh, work to uh, be part of your family and raise your children. And just uh, the Lord bless you and, and keep you. I want to uh, get into our study in Revelation today. Back to Revelation 21, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God, we do pray for your understanding and clarity and, Lord, what it is that you're speaking to us today. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just grant us uh, enlightening of, of our ears, Lord God, and our heart to hear and receive uh, your word and your truth and to let it, uh, Lord, move into our beings and uh, continue the work of transformation upon us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to jump in at Revelation 21, verse 10, uh, and get into our study. Today is the second part of, of uh, our last week's discussion regarding foundations. And verse 10 of Revelation 21 says, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And verse 14 then says, Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations. Last week we looked at the first of two thoughts regarding foundations. Let me just take a moment and remind uh, each one of us of that. I believe that God showed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a vision regarding uh, the finished city that John is describing to us in Revelation 21. The reason I say that is in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, beginning in verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. As I mentioned last week, if John is being shown the vision of the city in the future, it's very likely that God could have also shown that same vision uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The significance is, is that the reality of that finished city gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the assurance that God would accomplish his promise. And out of that assurance, they secured their faith in him, and that then influenced how they lived in the earth. So God is showing us the same vision of the finished work in an effort to help us in our current day to know that God will finish the work he has started and that God will fulfill all of his promises that he's made to us. The point is to have the same impact on our lives as it did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is to, one, cause us to put our faith securely in God and to also then influence how we live in this earth. One of the reasons it's important for us is because the scriptures make it clear we are going to encounter difficult circumstances in our lives. And then as we move towards the end of time, the events of Revelation come into play, which are going to be uh, bizarre, they're going to be painful, uh, they're going to be uh, afflictions. And God wants us to continue to trust him even in those times. One of the things we need to remember is, is that God's word makes it clear that he uses difficult circumstances in our lives to be part of our transformation into uh, the vessels he wants us to be. The takeaway from the first aspect of foundations is, is because God is showing us the future, and that we are there with him then, that we can know by faith that he is here with us now. 
I want to get into the second aspect of foundations today. There's going to be a number of pieces of information, and my prayer is that God helps pull all of them together uh, into uh, a singular of thought uh, that hopefully will, will make sense at the end. So hang with me in this, if you will. Revelation 21, verse 15, the Word of God says this, And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. There are a number of pieces in here, some of them we'll get to in a little bit. The text tells us that the city is laid out as square. Now the word square in the Greek actually means expansive into the four corners. So it's not necessarily square is what we think it means, yet the text tells us that the length and the width are the same, so we know that he is in fact talking about a square. The angel takes his rod and he measures the wall, and we're told it's 12,000 furlongs. You do the math, that's 1,500 miles. We're not given the specifics, the way the text reads. I take it to mean that uh, he's given us the perimeter of the whole city to be 1,500 miles. But that makes then each wall 325 miles long. One of the things that we run across is why is God giving us these details? Well, we're going to get into some of that today. We need to imagine a city, the walls of a city that run 325 miles in each direction, forming a square. But the text also tells us that the height of the wall is the same as the length. So we have to imagine a wall that runs 325 miles long and is 325 miles tall. It's a huge city. If you simply do the um, math of the length and the width, you end up with 140,000 square miles. I did some reference points. The state of Ohio is almost 45,000 square miles. I did some research on the internet to try and come up with some comparisons and basically to come up with a city the size that's being described in Revelation 21, you would have to take the square miles of Ohio, Pennsylvania, the state of Indiana, and Maryland combined. We have to imagine trying to build a wall that would encompass those four states that is 325 miles long, is 325 miles high, and later in the text we read is 144 cubits wide, that's 258 feet. We're talking about huge walls that are straight, that are level, and that are vertically plumb, because God does everything in perfection. The number 12,000, 12 times 1,000, 12 being a number used for spiritually government perfection, and 144, 12 times 12, is speaking to us and saying that God has created the city with perfection. I can't imagine attempting to build a wall of such great size and keeping everything perfect. It would be one thing to try and create a wall using uniform materials, cinder blocks or bricks or stones that are all cut to perfection. But we need to remember that this city that God is describing is a metaphor of the assembly of believers. That as we go through today's study, that we need to keep in mind that what God is describing to us is all of the believers across all of time being assembled together and abiding together in perfect unity. 
my mind immediately thought about my brother and I just when we were younger and being in the back seat of the family vehicle, not wanting each other in our own space, and the fighting that would go on in the back. He's, he's touching me. He's making move. Can't get along. And then my mind thought about even the way Christians have a tendency not to get along. Church splits. People get frustrated with one another. And I'm thinking, yet here is an assembly of believers across time involving languages and denominations and ideas in which God has created a city of perfection, bringing all believers into a place of unity. Clearly, one of the messages that I get out of this text is this city can only be fabricated by God. If man was given the responsibility to create such a structure, we would fail miserably, for we have a tendency to get offended easily. And yet here is a city structure built out of people that we lovingly stand together in peace and joy and kindness and gentleness seeking the face of our God together and collectively, worshiping him in unity. This structure clearly can only be built by God. Yet there's a piece of information contained in the text that sent me on a multi-week research as to what God was trying to say. When the angel measures the width of the city wall, we are told that it's 144 cubits according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. And depending on your translation, you'll get different ideas as to what that statement really means. But it was one that caught my attention. Why is it that here, nearing the end of all of the canon of Scripture, does God make the point of telling us what he used as the definition of a cubit. There are very, very few places in the scriptures where God ever mentions the definition. All the way back in Genesis chapter 6, when God told Noah to build the ark, and he gave him the dimensions, and he, he said this many cubits this way and this many cubits that way, God never explained to Noah what he meant. So it made me wonder, why does God make the point here of telling us that, that the cubit has a relationship to man? For those of you who may not know, the cubit measurement is actually from the elbow to the tip of the finger. The average is around 21 and a half inches or so. If you read through history, you'll find that there were a variety of things referred to as a cubit. Some of them went from the elbow to the bottom of the palm, but regardless, God is communicating something to us here that I wanted to know why he was telling us. And he tags it with, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel, and again, translations have to try and figure out some things to do with that. So some of them read, according to the measure of a man that the angel was using, is one of the variations of that sentence. But I think there's something here that God wants us to learn from. So I'm going to walk us through some various scriptures relating from the Old Testament to try and bring about what God is communicating. I'll start it with one thought and try and pull the pieces together. What we know is that God is the architect and God is the fabricator of this city. And the city is made up of believers. But God has enlisted we human beings as his partners 
in preparing the materials to build the city. I think one of the reasons that God speaks to us about the measure of a man is God is reminding us that while he's showing us the finished product, while he is currently fabricating that city, you and I as believers are involved in it. So I want to look at some things from the scriptures to draw upon what I think God is trying to communicate to us. The first one is, is since God's the only one who can actually create this city with perfection, but he wants our partnership with him, then we really need his spirit in order to do our job. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, in chapter 25, God comes to Moses after he had brought the people out of, out of Egypt and had them in the wilderness, and God says to Moses, I want my people to build a dwelling place for me. And the text says that he speaks to Moses the plans and says, you need to build this exactly according to the plans I give you. So God gives Moses the design, but he's not finished there. For in Exodus, Exodus chapter 35, God does something else. Beginning in verse 30 of Exodus 35, it says, And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord is called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach. In him and Aholiab, the son of Ahimishmach, of the tribe of Dan, he has filled them with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and tapestry maker the in blue and purple and scarlet thread, and fine linen and of the weaver, those who do every work and those who design artistic works. We read on in Exodus 36 that God gave his spirit to the craftsmen to accomplish the work. So God gives to Moses plans for the tabernacle and says you have to make it just like the plans. God knows that they can't do that if they don't have the skill, if they don't have the understanding, if they don't know what God means, if they don't know what God's intent is. So God places his spirit in two people in particular to know how to interpret the design and to know how to teach other people how to do the work. And then God makes sure that all of the craftsmen have his ability to actually accomplish what he wants done. God doesn't leave it to Moses and the others to come up with their own ideas. God has a plan. He wants human partners, and he imparts his spirit into them so that they can do exactly what God wants accomplished. When they have fabricated all of the materials, and Moses has them all assembled together, the glory of God comes. We move from that reference then into 2 Chronicles, or 1 Chronicles, excuse me, and we find that King David had a heart to build a house for God, but God had told him, you can't do this. But God told David that your son Solomon, he'll build the house. Nearing his last days, David has a conversation with his son Solomon, who will be king in his place. Listen to what David says to his son. In 1 Chronicles 28, beginning at verse 8, it says, Now therefore, in the sight of all Israel, 
the assembly of the Lord, and the hearing of our God, be careful to seek out all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and leave it as an inheritance for your children after you forever. The first thing that David says to his son, who's going to be king and reign over this nation, is seek God for everything. Your responsibility over this nation is to raise them up in the admonition of the Lord, to train them in his ways. So you've got to know what his ways are. So seek him. David goes on and says, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him. David says, just don't know about him. Know him. Have a relationship with him and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat, and the plans for all that he had by the Spirit. You see, David wanted to build a house for God, but God said, it's not going to be a job for you to do. It's going to be for your son. But this text tells us that God had given David the plans for the temple. In the same way that God had given plans to Moses for the tabernacle, God had given plans to David for the temple, and David passed them on to his son. When we get to Second Chronicles, David has passed away. His son Solomon has taken the throne. And one of the first things we find Solomon doing is praying to God for wisdom to do the task of being a king. In 2 Chronicles chapter 2, Solomon sends a letter to Hiram, king of Tyre, whom he and David were great friends. Solomon asks Hiram for supplies to build the temple, as well as some skilled craftsmen. While the text of Chronicles doesn't give us the same type of information as we read in Exodus, what we know is in the communication sent from Solomon to Hiram and the return letter that came back from Hiram, that both of these men acknowledge and worship the greatness of God. That they both understand that God is the one who's involved in all of this. So while we aren't expressly told that God gave his spirit to the workers, what we know is, is that when the temple was completed, that the glory of God came. The coming of God's glory tells us that they had done things the way God wanted them to. And the only way to accomplish that is by listening to the Spirit's movements. I want to launch into one more place here to make a, a point. The Israelites had walked away from God. God had sent prophet after prophet to call them back, and they refused to listen. In time, they were assaulted by the Assyrians and then later by the Babylonians. Numbers of them had been carried off into captivity to Babylon. And while in captivity, God comes to Ezekiel, a captive in the land of Babylon, and speaks to Ezekiel a number of things. One of them is to show Ezekiel a vision of a temple. I want to read through this today to make the connection to what we're being told in Revelation 21. I 
found in Ezekiel chapter 40, beginning in verse 1. And it says, In the 25th year of our captivity, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. Now, just hear what Ezekiel's saying. He's physically in the land of Babylon, and yet he says, God comes and takes me in the spirit to the land of Israel, to a mountain, and as I look to the south, I see something like a city. Now let me remind you of what John writes to us in Revelation 21. John says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the new, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. You see, there's great, great similarities between what Ezekiel writes and what John is speaking to us in Revelation Ezekiel says that God takes me in the spirit to the land of Israel and he shows me something like the structure of a city. In verse 3 of Exodus or Ezekiel 40, he says, He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. And the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and fix your mind on everything I show you. For you were brought here so that I might show them to you. Declare to the house of Israel everything you see. Ezekiel is taken in the spirit to the land of Israel. He is shown something like the structure of a city. And the man speaks to him and says, I have brought you here for a reason. I want you to take note of everything that I show you, and I want you to declare it to the people of Israel who are back in Babylon. So Ezekiel begins to describe, Ezekiel 40, verse 5, Now there was a wall around the outside of the temple, and the man's hand was a measuring rod six cubits long, each being a cubit and a hand breadth. Now, again, it's interesting that this is one of, I think, only three places in the scriptures, here, Revelation 21, and I believe there's one in Deuteronomy, where God gives any indication about what he means by cubit. I don't think that's happenstance. I believe there's a connection. And he measured the width of the wall structure, one rod, and the height, one rod. Then he went to the gateway, which faced east, and he went up the stairs, and measured the threshold of the gateway. Now, I'm not going to read through all of the measurements, but I want you to know that over the next 90 verses, this angel with the rod measures almost everything there is to measure about this, the wall that goes around the temple and of the temple itself. It's detail after detail after detail that Ezekiel is being required to record in order to convey that information. When we get through all of the measurements which gets us to Ezekiel 43, we begin to read this. Afterward he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east, and behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east, his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Folks, there's one thing that we know from the scriptures, that when God has been obeyed, when we have orchestrated and functioned in the earth according to the way God wants things to be, his glory comes. When the tabernacle was done by his instructions and according to his spirit, the glory of God came. When the temple was created, According to God's plans, and by the aid of his spirit, his glory came. And here we find in Ezekiel, God is showing Ezekiel a new temple, because the old one had been destroyed. He's giving him the vision of a new temple, and what has been completed the way it's supposed to be done, the glory of God comes. Perhaps 
For most of my life, people have been praying for a revival. Folks, if we want revival, we've got to be about the business of doing God's things, God's ways. His glory will come. But there are those stipulations. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Kabar, and I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Then I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he, being God, said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. God is saying to Ezekiel, this is my place. This is where I reside. And I dwell in the midst of the people, my people, forever. He goes on in the text and says, No more shall the house of Israel defile my name. They nor their kings by harlotry or with the carcasses of their kings on the high places. When they set their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost, with a wall between them and me, they defiled my name by the abominations which they committed. Therefore I have consumed them in my anger. He's a God is saying, I have dwelt in the midst of my people before. And even though there was only a wall that separated them and me, they did whatever they wanted. They didn't look to me. They didn't seek my face. They didn't honor me. They didn't fear me. They did whatever they pleased. They went with whatever God they wanted to. They did their own thing. And God said because of that, and because they refused to repent, I removed them from the land. In verse 9 he says, Now let them put away their harlotry and the carcasses of their kings, far away from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever. So God has gone through this whole measuring and describing to Ezekiel what the temple looks like. And in verse 10, then, God says to Ezekiel, Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. Now that's not the whole conversation. We'll get to the rest of it here in a minute. But I want to begin to break this down. God has shown Ezekiel incredible detail. And in the finished product, the glory of God returns. And God is saying to Ezekiel, While you're in captivity in Babylon, I want you to describe... What I have just shown you in the Spirit, I want you to describe it to the elders who are being held captive in Babylon. They're in Babylon because of their iniquities and because of their treatment of me. But I want you to describe this temple to them in all of its detail. And I want them to measure the pattern. Now, Again, there's more that we're going to get here to in a minute. Let me. What God wants the elders to do is as Ezekiel describes this temple to them, God wants them to begin to ponder and meditate on what they're seeing. And God says, Ezekiel, as you describe this to them, God's desire is, is that they'll be ashamed of how they treated him in the past. You see, I think there's a number of things that God is saying. One, God is communicating to them, 
This is what my temple could have been had you respected me all along. This is the glory that could have been in the land, and I could have been your God, and I would have dwelled in your midst, and you could have had relationship with me had you treated me properly from the beginning. So God is communicating, this is what you missed out on. But he's also saying to them, but there's the promise of you can be returned to this. So in the midst of realizing this is what we gave up, and yet God is offering to us another chance, God is saying, will the elders be ashamed of their iniquities? Will they realize that it was their treatment of God that has denied them of such an experience? Then God goes on and says, and if they are ashamed, of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangements, its exits, its entrances, its entire design and all of its ordinances, all of its forms and all of its laws. Write it down in their sight so that they may keep the whole design and its ordinances and perform them. God is saying to Ezekiel, if these people have remorse for the way that they have treated God, and are repentant, and they want to re-engage with him, then God says, then give them the detailed instructions. In other words, Ezekiel, if they're repentant and are willing to do things my way, then give them the design. We must realize that the converse is if they have no remorse, if they aren't willing to change their heart towards God, then they won't be part of the rebuilding of the temple. They won't be given the plan. Ezekiel 40, verse 12 says, This is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountain is most holy. Behold, there is a, this is the law of the temple. One of the reasons God went through such an extensive, specific measuring detail of the temple before Ezekiel was to make it clear that every inch of the temple is holy. Every piece of the temple is holy. Every stone, every window, every article that's used, every furnishing of the temple, God says it's holy. And one of the things that he's communicating is is if you're going to be part of my kingdom, if you're going to be participating with me, you must view me correctly and you must consider the fact that what you're doing is a holy work. One of the things that God is communicating to us is that he is fully capable of accomplishing such a great work. The other thing that God is making clear is if they're ashamed, if there's remorse, if there's repentance, if they are willing to honor me and to respect me, then they can once again participate in the building. One of the sad stories in the Old Testament is no sooner had they done the work of building the tabernacle and God had explained that the tabernacle was holy. 
that two of Levi's sons treated God with disrespect. They didn't use the buckets that God had them create. They just grabbed their buckets and they threw fire in their buckets and they just walked right in before God, not having any respect for him at all. Not being obedient to his commands or his ways, not having any any um, honor for who God was. They simply walked in there and they were done. And God was making it clear and he says to, to uh, Aaron, I must be considered holy. Anyone who comes before me must treat me this way. So God is communicating something to us. One more piece, just adding to this. When the captives had returned from the land of Babylon and began the building process, they struggled. They were still too much of their humanness involved. They were fearful of people who were threatening them. They started to do their own thing, build their own houses. And God speaks to them through the prophet Haggai. And he calls them back to the mission and says, Look, I brought you back because... The objective is for you and I to be restored in relationship and for you to build this house that I'm going to dwell in and the relationship works out of your honor and respect of me and obedience to what I say. And in Haggai chapter 1, it says that the priests and the people listened to the words of Haggai, which God had spoken to him. They accepted those words. And received them as authoritative. And the Spirit of God came upon them and they built the structure. I believe this reference in Revelation 21 that the measurement standard that this angel is using, the cubit being the measure of a man that is of an angel, that God is speaking to you and I in our day, and saying, you are intended to be participants with me in the building of this holy structure. That the measure of a man isn't just the length of from your elbow to the tip of your finger, but the measure of the man is the heart condition of the man who's going to be involved in this. That as God said to Ezekiel, if they are ashamed of their iniquities and they repent and come into a relationship with me from honor and respect and obedience, then they get to participate. So I believe God is saying the same thing to us. That you and I get to participate with God in the building of this structure if we have the right heart attitude. Do we function from the right relationship? You see, there's some interesting things about this structure. Because the city wall is a metaphor of God assembling believers. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 says, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Now it's part of a larger conversation that Paul was having with the people because there was great conflict in the church as to who was better. Who had the greater giftings? So Paul goes through this whole discussion about spiritual gifts, trying to help them understand that one gift isn't better than the others, that each one has its own place, and, and each gift is put in people for the sake of building other people up. So part of what's being communicated is, is the fact that you and I don't get to pick and choose what gift we will have from God, or what our mission in the earth will be, or, as I like to think of it this way... <laughs> None of us get to choose 
where in the building of the wall we get placed. Even more so, none of us get to choose who the believers will be that are on either side of me, or in front of me, or behind me, or underneath me, or on top of me. And I think God, in his humor, probably looks at all of our denominations and says, you know what, when I build this wall, I'm going to mix it up a bit. I'm going to take people who have different tastes in music and I'm going to stick them side by side. I'm going to take people who have different ideas of what my word says and I'm going to put them right next to each other. And it made me start thinking, is my heart attitude towards God one of a willingness to let him do with me whatever he wants. Because the plans for this holy city are God's plans. And the way that I interpret Ezekiel is, if I'm going to be a believer and participate with God in this assembly of believers, i got to do it his way. And if I'm going to do it his way, I need his help. I need the fullness of his spirit to come and mold me and shape me and transform me so that my attitude towards God, but also towards my fellow believers, is his character. I'm amazed at how many churches split over the silliness of things. And yet, every group that starts wants the glory of God to come. We love to quote the scripture, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. It's a true statement, but let's understand the context. The context is, even as I've walked through today, is if we gather in an attitude of respect and honor of who he is and of the submission of myself to his will in my life, then there's a holy habitation for him to come. But if we simply gather thinking that we're going to do our own thing and simply claim the title of Christian and that somehow God's going to have to honor that and show up in our midst, that's not what the Word of God says. The first place I must consider if I'm going to participate in the building of God's structure is, am I willing to let God be the molder and shaper of my life? Am I willing to let God come and do in me what needs to be done so that I become a holy vessel of his? Paul, writing in the church of Philippi, says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who, though he was on the throne, gave up the throne and didn't try to claim it and hang on to it, but gave that up, came into the earth as a human being, and was fully submitted to his Father. Including death, on the cross. Am I willing to go through difficult circumstances so that other people might see the glory of God in me? Or am I only willing to follow God when things are going to go really, really well? According to my thoughts and plans.
Another way that we must realize and deal with is the fact that it's not only us that's being transformed as participants in this, but all of us have a ministry that affects other people. So as I live my walk with God, am I discipling other people to be followers of Tim? Am I teaching them to be followers of the world, or am I teaching them to be followers of God? In other words, are other people who my life is influencing and discipling, are they learning from me to walk with God and be obedient to Him, or are they learning from me you can have all kinds of lords. I think one of the things God is saying to us is if you're going to be involved in my building project, you've got to understand what discipleship means. And then it goes beyond discipling it also involves how am I simply treating other people? Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, was talking to them about their attitude. <laughs> he uses the context of what we call the Lord's Supper. As I've often described to people, we have to think outside of the terms of the way we do communion today, we have to think in the terms of the early church. It says they met from house to house. They spent time in the Word together. They fellowshiped together. They ate meals together. If we're going to understand what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth. We have to think in terms of what I would say is a carry-in dinner. What Paul is saying to them is, look, you show up to the house early, with the food that you brought and food that other people brought, and you just go ahead and eat. You don't wait for everybody to show up. And by the time some people are just arriving to the house, you're already on your second or third plate. And sometimes when people get there, everything is already gone. And that's the context where Paul, writing to this church, says, you're not discerning the body. You're not realizing that you're being selfish. And you're not considering the needs of others. To which Paul says, look, if you're that hungry... Eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at home before you go to the dinner. Put something in your belly to shut off the, the, the nerve endings that say it's time to eat because you need to be going with an attitude of putting others ahead of you. So bring your food with a full belly and let other people go and have their needs met. He said, that's the way you're supposed to be treating one another. The context is how are we treating other people? Jesus ups the standard. Matthew 5, he says to us, love your enemies. Bless those who hurt you, cause you pain. Do good to those who mistreat you. Care for them. He says, then you'll be sons of God. You see, in the, in the picture of hope of this city in Revelation, God is also speaking to us a message of instruction of what it means to be participants with him in the building of this structure. But folks, here's the great thing. Here's the exciting part. That because God is showing us the completed picture, what that says to me is, if I will follow God's plan,
plans and ways now. I'm there. In other words, that if I'm willing to honor the Lord as my Lord and obey Him and let Him dictate the decisions and movements of my life, that God in His promises will walk with me through every difficulty I will experience and use that challenge to mold me and make me into his image so that I can be part of his city then. This image of God's holy city is a message to us of God's faithfulness. That in our most dire moments, God will be there because he promised to be. And that God will complete in us what he has started. So that the fact that you and I will be there in that day. That we can rely upon him, trust him, and find our rest in him now. Regardless of what we're going through. So this vision carries a number of ideas behind it. I hope they have pulled together and have helped us see what God is speaking to us in our day. It is a message of hope. It is a message of assurance. But it's also a message of instruction. We cannot let go of the standard by which we're called to walk. Revelation paints some very troubling times that are coming. Our current day, I think, is just a snapshot. But folks, my heart is broken by the way I see people treat one another, respond to one another. And I'm reminded that Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 that in those last days when things get tough, that many will fall away and the love of most will grow cold. And it's sad that in our current situation, that's already happened. Critical spirits, judgmentalism, impatience, lack of kindness, little mercy, little gentleness. The people are lashing out at one another. That people want to get back to meeting in the church to make a political statement. I won't do that, people. Gathering together as brothers and sisters is to worship our God in respect and honor and looking for his direction in our lives and to praise him for who he is and what he has done and and to uplift one another into his promises so that we can live the way we're supposed to live and build the holy city. But if gathering together is simply to make some kind of a statement, I'll never meet again. If it's to rebel against our politicians or government officials, it's not the attitude God wants us to have. There are times for standing against the things that are wrong. But folks, even when we do that, God says, you should be doing that when my spirit leads you to. And in the nature of who I am. God 
God wants to build a holy city. He's building a holy city and he will. The question, I think, is, as Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, we need to examine ourselves. Am I looking to God for his plans and relying upon his spirit to accomplish that? Or am I trying to do things my own way? We need to bring that before the Lord and listen to what he's telling us. I want to see the glory of God come into this earthly realm and touch the lives of people, heal their hurts, break bondages. And he will if we'll do it his way. Let's make that our mission. Heavenly Father, your word can be challenging, but that's a good thing. You're calling us, Lord, to a place in you that will manifest your presence wherever we are. And that as the letter to the Galatians says that the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, patience, there is no law against them. Man can't create a law that would make us stop being that way. So help us to come into a relationship with you that lets your spirit flow in his fullness in us that we will display your glory, your fruit, your character to people around us regardless of whether we agree or disagree over things that are happening. Bring us back, O oh God, to the right place in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching.